everyone can sign up. There will be people still coming, so we'll give a, 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 a few more seconds. Not minutes, a few seconds. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it looks like everybody should be able to participate and come straight in now, so um, I'll hand over to you, Yulong. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, so first, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, specific session of the uh, Cross Hub conference. Uh, and uh, this is the first a uh, and uh, is uh, uh, from our energy storage, uh, CPG energy storage uh, network uh, plus program, and uh, we're hosting this. And uh, uh, so um, I'm going to just uh, give a welcome. Uh, thank you, Raja, for joining us. And uh, um, there is some um, <clears throat> housekeeping uh, to do, and uh, it's easy because uh, there are no firing. Uh, alarm whatever it happens and then uh, so so just need to still uh, keep quiet and probably uh, uh, mute yourself mute yourself and unless you're talking and uh, um, so the today's main meeting is about role and value of uh, energy storage uh, technologies for next year 2050 and uh, so um, uh, Dr. Harris uh, I can't even pronounce his his uh, other part of the name, it's uh, very long, and uh, we've uh, <laughs> have been trying, but 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 uh, anyway. So uh, Harris will will chair the the first part of the uh, 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 meeting on the uh, storage technology, particularly for uh, uh, various aspects from uh, heating, cooling to transport and to power system. And uh, so, without much ado, I'll hand over to Harris. So the floor is yours, and and the rest of the Speakers. Thanks, Thanks Yu Long. Um, well, as, as Yu Long said, we have a, uh, a panel session planned for uh, today in the role of uh, storage to, uh, to net zero. So we've got uh, three uh, experts uh, from uh, different fields, transport, heating and cooling and power. And we also have a representative from uh, BASE, so we'll cover uh, hopefully uh, some policy uh, aspects. Um, so the, the idea is that we'll have three presentations and then we'll open up uh, the room for questions and answers, but also for a uh, discussion. Uh, before that, I'd like to um, share my screen and uh, make a very short introduction about the uh, Supergen uh, storage uh, network. So hopefully I'll uh, manage to do that. Um, I think I've now shared my screen. And uh, OK, so uh, my name is Harris Patios. I'll be chairing this session. I'm a co-director of the uh, Supergen Energy Storage uh, Network Plus, which is um, quite uh, new, I would say. Um, unfortunately, we just started a few months before the pandemic, so a lot of it has been, uh, a lot of the role has been a bit uh, hurriedly. Uh, at a glance, the network is led by Professor Yulong Dean, who opened the uh, session from the University of Birmingham, but uh, gathers 19 academics from 12 different institutions. We've got uh, a total of 1.2 million uh, of funding, uh, one of uh, 1 million from EPSRC, and quite a sizable amount of that is dedicated for flexible funding. So uh, we're not so much um, uh, in mission to 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 uh, do research, uh, but uh, actually uh, fund research, but also bring the community together. We've got strong in kind support and a range of uh, project partners who are actively uh, supporting us in this uh, endeavor. Uh, so uh, we've got 48 months in duration, having started, as I said, in September 2019. Now the. Uh, the reason why uh, we pulled together this uh, this network is uh, because we felt there was uh, a gap, there is some uh, fragmentation, although we have a lot of funding uh, in storage, a lot of activity, especially in the UK, and uh, we're in a position to be world leading in that domain. There's still quite a lot of uh, fragmentation, not only between 
uh, disciplines, but also between uh, academia, between industry, uh, between decision making, uh, government. So the intention is to bring everyone uh, together to serve the uh, community by bringing everyone uh, together and create an ecosystem uh, of uh, different disciplines, different entities, different stakeholders, understanding the need to bring all that together because storage doesn't only uh, cover uh, a lot of technologies, but also uh, brings together or should be bringing together a lot of disciplines. There's a lot of impact to be had, uh, so we do intend to um, bridge uh, that gap. Now, as I said, we, we are working across technologies, not only in one technology, but we, um, we cover many technologies like electrochemical storage, electrical, thermal, mechanical and chemical. And we're not only interested in storage itself, but the integration of that into energy networks, the impacts on society, uh, the impacts on the technologies and vice versa, environmental, economical and policy uh, considerations and topics like artificial intelligence and, bring, and big data. So some of our activities uh, short term include uh, exploring potential for uh, joint flexible funding calls. A lot of the time we try to do that jointly as we've done in the past with other UKRI hubs and institutions. We uh, have targeted uh, workshops to promote uh, building and promoting relationships between industry and academia. And we hopefully um, have managed and are still continuing to uh, advance and nurture early career researchers uh, by uh, bringing or creating uh, forums. Uh, we've, uh, we intend to continue doing that uh, on a more long term basis, uh, support early career researchers, uh, target uh, funding to promote underrepresented uh, groups or uh, join up larger consortia and address uh, more significant uh, challenges that, uh, as I said, often are uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, I'd like, before I close, to uh, bring your attention one of the next uh, workshops uh, we're going to be uh, holding. That's on the 15th of September. Uh, it's mainly uh, focused in um, promoting relationships, as I said, with industry. So it's vision, challenges, innovation and deployment and experience where we'll try and highlight uh, business and market needs uh, for attracting investment uh, on storage and speed up uh, relevant applications. There's uh, quite a lot more information in our website, uh, supergenstorage.org. So I'll uh, welcome you to uh, have a look and uh, get in touch with, uh, with any questions. Now, um, we've got a, uh, a lot of means of uh, keeping uh, in touch with you. Uh, I've listed some of the uh, social media but also website links here uh, and uh, Angela Fifth guys always happy to answer your uh, questions uh, regarding the network or any other activity uh, we might have. So please feel free to to get in touch. I'll now stop sharing my screen and uh, I think we're ready to introduce the uh, first uh, talk. Uh, this is going to be from Professor Andrew Cruden uh, on transport. So um, Professor uh, Cruden is uh, a professor in energy technology within engineering and the environment at the University of Southampton. He has significant experience in the field of uh, renewable energy, uh, particularly in fuel cell technologies and uh, condition monitoring of uh, wind turbines. Uh, the interest in fuel cell technology led indirectly to an interest in the field of electric vehicles and subsequently to uh, research activity in energy storage, both uh, batteries and supercapacitors and uh, traction uh, drives uh, and through a lot of EBSRC and uh, TSB funded projects. So, Andrew, uh, I'm not sure if you're ready to I, I share your so, screen. Just to be clear, I'm sharing my screen, Amma, when I, when I present. Is that correct? Sorry, say again, Andrew. Can I just check that I'm sharing my screen? That there's yeah, not... if, if that's OK, I, I think yeah, you should be uh, as a, uh, assigned as a presenter. Uh, mm -hmm. But if. Give this a go, that's fine. Let me just see if I can bring this up. Hopefully that's now presenting, is it? 
Yes, it is. Excellent. Okay. Good stuff. So I believe I have ten minutes on this. Yes. So, uh, and again, I was I was asked to talk about transport. So let's make a start. So just to to start with some context. Clearly, there's a, a large government and societal interest in reducing greenhouse emissions, particularly in the transport, and that is predominantly being done through the, the process of electrification. So clearly the UK has, has legislated that it's going to end the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Uh, it's currently consulting on a date for phasing out the sale of, of new diesel HGVs, so again, the, the larger, more freight-based vehicles. And again, if that, that first element is on road transport, then there are other similar activities happening probably at a different pace in the other transport sector. So rail, again, rail is aiming to remove diesel only trains or take them out of service by 2040. Uh, in maritime, the International Maritime Organization has a target of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas by 2050. And in aviation, again, currently they have introduced sustainable aviation fuel, which is effectively a, a, a renewable or in, in lots of instances it is a a kind of waste-based uh, element or a biofuel for that. I'm currently exploring Fly Zero, so there have been a number of elements uh, and demonstrations of electric and fuel cell planes as well. So lots of activity across that sector in terms of electrification. And again, just to put it into context across those different sectors as well, by far and away the, the largest contributor to uh, carbon dioxide emissions from the transport sector is passenger cars. So clearly that's where, uh, again, most of the, the activity has to be focused and that's where the greatest market opportunities are as well. And this graph hopefully gives you some flavour of the different percentage uh, emissions from those different sectors. Again, just in terms of scale as well, the, the global battery demand is expected to increase by some 14 times between now and 2030. So again, a significant rate of, of expansion, probably 20% uh, average uh, growth per year. The global battery market, again, an estimate, they, they feel it's something like $150 billion by 2030. Uh, and again, just to put that into context, if that's the battery market, clearly one element within transport is hydrogen fuel cells. So just to give some idea of scale, again, that global fuel cell market is forecast to, fit, to hit about $9 billion. Uh, by 2030. So just to give some, some sense of skill for that. And the market for EV batteries is already 10 times that for grid scale batteries. And again, I know there's going to be a subsequent talk on, on more of the grid scale activities uh, in just a few minutes. And again, in terms of performance requirements, I would direct you to some very good uh, roadmaps that the Advanced Propulsion Centre has, has produced. Uh, if I ever just try and see if I can bring up my pointer. We go. Again, we have a, a graph here from the, this is the, the kind of automotive roadmap for, for batteries. Again, in terms of energy storage, we have energy and power. And clearly, we have, uh, in, in terms of the colouring here, light duty vehicles, again, really vans and passenger cars. In terms of the, the power for, for example, sports cars, etc., down to more uh, normal passenger cars. It is probably down on the left hand side of this sector compared to, for example, this light grey sector, which is really the heavy goods vehicle, where clearly power is, is a major requirement, uh, again, in terms of moving these, these heavy loads and energy in terms of the range for it. So to give you some, some metrics in terms of that, again, the definition of those metrics is in the, uh, the roadmap, so let me direct you towards them. And uh, although this is one, uh, an image from one of the battery of the energy storage one, there is a separate one for fuel cells as well. And again, just <laughs> a bit of flippancy. Uh, the reason I'm putting these up is, uh, as well as cars and other vehicles, effectively electrification, both batteries and fuel cells have been used and demonstrated in a whole range of different transport applications. So everything from a lawnmower, uh, obviously submarines have had batteries and fuel cells in it for a large number of years. So this technology in lots of instances is not new. It's about refining it, reducing the cost, making it reliable and getting infrastructure in place uh, to, to support them. 
One of the other aspects, again, in terms of, of transport that's, that's fairly recently been flagged is there's increasing and growing concern over the anticipated volumes and therefore the processing challenges of end-of-life batteries, particularly the lithium ion-based ones. So clearly, as most manufacturers have already announced significant plans to go electric only or to go and promote new electric models, the battery capacity that we're going to see in our roads and given that a typical uh, vehicle lifetime for a passenger car may only be between 15 years, something like that, again, the processing required to handle the end of life batteries and ideally try and recover as much of that material as we can is critical. And currently, we don't really have that capability. So that is something that, uh, again, in terms of trying to prevent this material going into landfill waste or, or all of our waste streams is to try and make uh, as much use of that and recovery of that as we can. And to do that, again, there's increasing regulation being developed. So uh, only late last year, the EU has proposed, and I know we are not strictly part of the EU, but I'm sure we will follow a number of their uh, the regulations and develop our own in a similar fashion to try and up the targets and the rates of collection of batteries, again, including vehicle batteries, which tend to be, dare I say, fairly straightforward to do because it is a, is a tracked product from both manufacturer licensing through the, the vehicle registration, the V5, the MOT process to end of life and scrapping. That's regulated, so it's fairly straightforward from that perspective compared to consumer batteries, which are much more difficult to track. But in terms of upping the rates for, for battery collection and therefore the recovery rates of taking a battery pack from a vehicle, you then have the outer uh, support and, and enclosure for that. All the electronics for the BMS, you might have a thermal management system in there, the various connections as well before you actually get into the various cells and the elements of recovery. You then have different chemistries to deal with uh, that have different constituent elements that might be tried to recover as well. So again, legislation is clearly coming in terms of mandating in that, and that is a challenge for, for transport energy storage per se. Again, I think a key element in, in transport is thinking of the numbers of vehicles that we have and this uh, increasingly rapid transition to electrification Again, we will end up with significant capacities of batteries on our roads uh, and therefore parked at various times as well for recharging. So again, I think one of the key aspects of, of energy storage uh, activity is linking that transport capacity to some elements of, of the grid requirements for that through, for example, vehicle to grid, where we're aggregating EV batteries in a substantial basis as, as the numbers of, of vehicles and the charging capability increases as well. Now, there are a number of you know, fairly sensible trials going on, one with Volvo Energy and a, a bus-based one with Scottish and Southern Energy, uh, and they are UK ones, there are other examples of this around, around the globe. And again, the good thing about this is this, this is battery technology neutral. Uh, so again, I think it, in lots of instances, we will have this capacity and we can use that capacity to support the grid, again, regardless of the technology we actually have on the, the vehicle. And again, in terms of some of the, the future look, clearly lithium ion technology is, is dominant just now. There are new technologies and new developments in technology ongoing. This is just one example of the Solbat project funded by the Faraday Institution, where again, rather than some lithium salts, we're now using lithium metal, which again will have its own challenges when it comes to the recovery of that metal uh, from used batteries if and dependent on the ultimate commercial prospects for this uh, once it's, it's, it's coming towards the end of its research phase. But again, clearly we can see some of the projected benefits of, of this technology being increases in both gravimetric and volumetric energy density and therefore the, the vehicles themselves should be lighter and therefore the performance and range should be better as well.
Just lastly, just to try to conclude, uh, again, effectively, there does remain a very clear technology race, both in batteries per se, in terms of the different materials that are used in the whole range of different uh, lithium chemistries, uh, as well as new incumbents, including silicon and sulfur compounds, multivalent batteries as well, as well as then battery versus hydrogen fuel cell uh, technology. Significant growth in global government support, uh, again, subsidy will, it, or not will, is delivering that change. So again, we can see many reports in the, the, the media about this change that's happening right now. Again, I've flagged the, the waste and processing challenges of these end-of-life batteries. And again, I do think that vehicle-to-grid will enable a better linkage between transport, energy storage, and grid energy storage requirements. And I think I'll just finish there. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I guess we we can, uh, as I said, have uh, questions at the end after every uh, presenter has a chance to speak. But thanks for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, next, we've got Professor Zibin Wu from the University uh, of Glasgow. Um, his interest is focused on thermal energy uh, technologies and their fundamental uh, thermal dynamics, uh, heat transfer, fluid dynamic problems. He's particularly interested in developing novel technologies for heating, cooling, and power generation. And uh, I think he's going to uh, be telling us more uh, about this uh, just now. So, so can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see the screen. Thanks. OK, thanks uh, for the introduction. To you. Thank, okay. you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to share some of our thoughts about the role of the thermal so energy storage in the future uh, net zero world, uh, particularly heating and cooling. And I guess most of you have already seen these figures probably a few times somewhere else. So this gives us a very visualized view about how the heating problem is. So particularly heating probably takes, uh, consumes about half of the energy consumption in the UK, particularly 55% in the Scotland, even worse. And so I was making it even worse is that it's fluctuating all the time over year compared with the electricity. And so it is much more, it's much more fluctuating from the summer to winter. And if we zoom in a little bit more to see the details, so let's say we take one year from, say, May 2015 to April or May 2016, and we have a look how this fluctuating look like. So it basically, it starts with uh, the minimum about, say, um, 400 gigawatt hour per day, and it changes from the summertime, the August time, to the uh, winter time, say, January, it was about 2,300 or, or, or 2,500 or 600 gigawatt uh, hour per day. So if we look, this minimum demand, that is pretty much uh, weather independent, probably will be more likely related to cooking hot water or some industrial applications. So where there is an, a very strong uh, time variant um, uh, changing variation component, that is uh, weather, into, uh, weather dependent, this is very likely is due to the consumption uh, for the space heating. So if we assume the all weather dependent gas consumption as uh, the space heating or heat demand, so we are talking about the fluctuation from zero to 2,300 gigawatt hour per day. And so that is a huge a gap there. So if we look at the total of the year, this roughly gave us uh, the whole total heat demand for the UK per year will be uh, 400 to 450 uh, terawatt hour. And if we think we can have magic technology with 100% interseasonal energy storage, and we produce or gather heat in the summertime, and then somehow you know re discharge it, release it for heating in the winter to basically balance the demand to shave the peak, and then then we roughly look, locate about 50 terawatt hour capacity. So that is a huge a potential here, a huge opportunity or challenge, whatever, about the interseasonal energy storage for heat. And if we look at the look at the further domain to a day, 
So here we take an example, say we take a few houses or properties. In Scotland, as an example, with relatively poor insulation and we look at the heat demand over a day, so we can see there is a, there is not even, so in the early morning, and when everyone got up and then before they go to work. So there is a peak demand. And also there's another peak demand in the early evenings when everyone come home and before they go to bed. So again, there's a, a big, big peak of demand here. So again, there's is an uneven demand of heat demand, uh, heat, heat, heat supply, space heating. And so that will require some sort of uh, short-term thermal energy storage uh, to manage the demand and supply at least to shape the peak. So now the question is really interesting for us is how big that scale would be in terms of the whole UK, and particularly in 2050, we are talking, we are talking to reach net zero in 2050, and the scale of the problem is huge because half of our energy consumption is heat. So that we need to basically break down the heat demand to hourly or half hourly data to look at uh, how much heat we would need per day. And so that's what we did. So we actually tried to develop a model. So this model, we just take the whole UK uh, building stock and put them into a, a model, a physical model. And we call the bot a bottom-up model and using a, a design builders and energy plus. And then we put all the weather conditions and insulation never into it. And so the weather conditions are different from one part of the UK to another part. So basically we spread the whole UK into uh, eight different regions and according to their weather patterns. And in this way, we can then actually uh, calculate the heat demand uh, any, any hour of the day. And for the whole UK, when we add them together, we roughly can work out the hourly heat demand. So before we, using this model to calculate the heat demand in 2050, we actually use this model to calculate the heat demand of 2020, uh, 2010, because we knew that a gas consumption data, and also there's another model developed by uh, a Loftbar team, uh, um, Stephen Watson. So already uh, break down, broke down the um, uh, gas consumption to, to heat uh, on hourly base. But what they did was they used an approach. They gathered the gas meter data from about 6,000 properties and then used that as a reference to uh, break down the gas, total gas consumption, consumption to hourly uh, heat demand. But this model has a problem because you don't have the gas meter data in 2050. So you cannot predict 2050, only can analyze the uh, historic data. So we then actually develop this bottom-up data uh, model then to compare with this model so ver to verify it. And here is the comparison between the two models for 2010. So it looks a uh, very good agreement. So then we got some confidence. We then actually use this model to find out the hourly data uh, heat demand for, you know, let's say start with 2010, this is a very cold year in recent years. And then we actually worked out, you know, the, the heat demand, peak demand is in January, a, a particular day with about 300 gigawatts. And the total heat demand of the whole year is uh, including both space heating and domestic hot water is estimated as around 415 uh, terawatt hour. This is pretty much close to the rough estimation using the gas consumption data in the previous slides. So now we actually can use this model and the put to predict the heat demand and the, the hourly heat demand of 2050 for the whole UK. So we need to take into account a few different things now because there's a global warming, so the temperature will increase uh, year by year to 2050. And also the legislation uh, of the government have required we, us to improve the uh, insulation of houses and the properties. So here we actually um, selected the, uh, a value of 30%. So 30% improvement of uh, how, uh, house in, uh, insulation. And also there will be new houses come to the market. And so in general, the heat demand actually decreases slightly or significantly, I would say. And so the peak heat demand actually now, uh, in, according to the predictions in 2050, after the global warming and the insulation improvement by 30%, will be about 175 gigawatts um, anytime. And the total annual heat demand for space heating and the domestic whole water, so now can be estimated and uh, predicted as about 250 terawatt hour. So again, you can see there's a fracturation 
between uh, from month to month and from uh, hour to hour. If you look at this direction. So now, because we are talking about a the electrification of heat or the heating decarbonization, so obviously uh, at the moment, as uh, you know, base is looking at the possibility of electrify heat using heat pumps, and that is the main route at the moment. But I'm not saying not other routes are not possible. It's just the is it, one of the possible routes. So let's assume we use heat pump and with a COP of 2.9 to, to produce all the heat to meet the demand. We then say take 2010 data as an example. We convert to take this heat demand divided by 2.9 and add the electricity demand the same year. So we end up with the total electricity demand peak will be 150 uh, gigawatts. And so the, that year, the heat, the electricity demand is only 50 um, gigawatt. So that means you are triple, you will triple the peak uh, electricity demand because of the electrification of heat. And considering the current inst uh, installed capacity of about 100 gigawatt, that means we are talking about you need to, you need to install 50 gigawatt new uh, power generation capacity. And that is not going to work because it's too expensive and you only use them in the winter for, for, for a few days without using the in summer. So that doesn't work. We need to consider, you know, a storage and flexibility to shape the peak demand. And if we look at put this in the scenario of 2050, according to the prediction we made, so what we look like is in 2050, uh, in 2050, the predicted heat demand peak in January will be 170 gigawatt, and somehow in this range. And the national grid also predicted. The electricity demand uh, in 2050 will be around 100 gigawatts, but that has already taken into account the electric vehicle. But I'm not sure whether they have already taken into account the heat pump heat, uh, electricity consumption. So it's uncertain there. And so if now we convert all the heat demand through heat pump and with a COP of 2.9, we divided the blue line uh, by 2.9 plus the uh, orange line. So we end up with this total electricity demand with a peak demand of about a 130 uh, giga, gigawatt. So again, if we take it, compare with today's uh, 2020 installation, uh, installed the capacity that was 100 gigawatts. In any case, we are still talking about, you need to install another 25 to 30 gigawatt power generation uh, capacity to only to look to, uh, for the um, heat pumps. So again, this is as a huge, and it's not probably not feasible or viable uh, in terms of the, the scale. So what we actually will do is now actually, if we look at a particular day, say, let's say the maximum heat demand day of uh, a day for the UK in 2050, what you can see is the heat demand actually fluctuating very significant over the day with a big peak in the morning time and the early evening time. So. Are we going to use electricity anytime we want, or we actually act, can um, use the heat pump to produce heat the whole day, but store it when we don't need it? In that case, we can somehow shave the peak, peak demand and then reduce the impact to the grid. So when we look at this, we can roughly estimate the scale. And according to this diagram, the domestic heat, including the space heating and the hot water in 2050, this roughly gave us a figure, say 100 and 250 gigawatt hour uh, heat storage we will need and uh, to shave this peak. So that gave us roughly the idea in 2050, what, how much heat storage we will need to shave the peak of the heat demand in the domestic uh, setting sector. And so that is, uh, is about from the perspective of heating and uh, decarbonization or electrification. And also, as the global warming kicks in, the temperature will increase. Actually, another headache will come is the cooling. Particularly this year, I think in the, in the south, particularly in London, the heat, the cooling was a big problem. So there also a report recently published by UKIRK estimated in 2050. So the, in the highest scenario, there will be uh, the Electricity demand in the evening, early evening, will be increased by uh, seven gigawatts. 
and one was also was from the University of Birmingham. And this were adding the, to the problem as we just explained in the in the heating sector. And so again, as you can see, the demand of the the the, the electricity curve has been dramatically changed due to the uh, cooling de uh, cooling um, demand. So again, there is another uh, possibility we can use cold thermal energy storage to manage the um, to balance the demand and the supply and to shave the peak and to reduce the impact uh, to the grid. So, so roughly and um, a very quick kind of introduction, uh, say from a perspective of a heating um, angle. And so, as uh, here is a very quick, very quick uh, remarks for, to conclude in my uh, discussion. So, both of the heating and the cooling will impose huge impact to the grid. And we need storage to provide the flexibility to mitigate this impact. And the scale of this is huge. It's, as I just explained, it will be a tens of gigawatt uh, a scale. And, and, and also, um, both the interseason and long-term and storage and short-term storage are essential both for this to address this issue. And uh, of course, cooling will impose some challenges, but it will be less than the heating problem. And again, the cooling, uh, cold, cold thermal energy storage can also play a big role in the future and net zero cooling system. Um, thank you very much. And I, I think I, I, I need to stop now. Thank you. Um, as I said, we'll um, park questions for the end, but I think the closing remarks takes us, uh, will take us nicely to the next uh, talk uh, from uh, Professor Ji Hong Wang from the University of Warwick. Um, Ji Hong is a professor of uh, electrical power and control engineering and the School of Engineering. And her research interests include power system modeling and control, energy storage and grid integration, uh, energy efficient actuators, and optimal uh, control uh, methods. So uh, Ji Hong, whenever you're ready, uh, we can we can see you. I hope you'll be able to, to share your screen as well. Okay. I just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, but uh, okay. not in presenter uh, viewer. Yeah. Okay, you can just yeah. yeah. No, it's that's no, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, I think I try to finish in a short time, and the the presentation I just use the title given by the by our project manager, and uh, so the the presentation re is representing two of us, me and my colleague Dr. Weiher. Weiher is now is a senior research fellow, hold five years Royal Academy of Engineering fellowship. Okay, so right. Let's start from this. That's uh, yesterday's UK energy uh, power generation source. And from this uh, yesterday's, we can see we have a, a fossil fuel and wind, solar and other clean energies. And that's a combination of this. And also we can see the demand change every, it is recorded every 10 minutes. And uh, so this gave the grid national grid or grid operators a big challenge and because we need the electricity generated must meet the demand that must be balanced to maintain the grid operation uh, stably. So that's uh, it, this month, last month and the last years and the generation. To maintain the grid ba uh, balance I need a lot of uh, mechanisms and strategy and again it's very costly and that's a uh, the cost from 25th August this month, uh, last month, and that's how much spend on maintaining the grid balance. And so that's the energy need to maintain the balance. So they hmm? can't change it. And uh, that's for 25th August a single day and 10 grid balance, the cost 5.59 million. So this including uh, frequency control and the positive reserve and negative reserve and others. Anyway, that's combined, that's the cost for the day. With the cost that indicate the need. So this need and is trying to 
and the balance the great generation and the uh, and the, and the, the the usage and uh, so we need some energy to dispatch for and traditionally all this been done by fossil fuel we store energy in the fossil fuel when we need we just burn it and then get to the power but now need multi mechanisms and uh, certainly that's a good come to see and uh, this um, this this kind of need and uh, also increase when we have a more renewable energy on certain and uh, intermittent en renewable energy into the grid. That's the uh, uh, 2005 to 2014 and the balance cost increase. But look at the now and there is a prediction from National Grid website that predicted in December 2020 is needed 2000 million pound for grid balance in next year from December 2020, but when I checked the figure in August, and there's a new prediction, 2,357 million pounds needed for next 12 months. So that means when we have more and more renewable energies and uh, uh, intermittent energy generations into the grid, we need more such kind of balance service. And this certainly and uh, created a market, created a need to give energy storage room and to get into this market to provide the service. So, and look at globally, that's a battery energy storage installation. In the UK, by end of 2020, there are around one gigawatts battery storage in operation and also another four gigawatts storage project in planning, try, uh, in uh, some in construction, some uh, in, the, in the planning stage. And uh, this uh, map shows the, the the UK battery storage side, and so the largest uh, battery energy storage plant in the UK now is 100 megawatts already in operation, and this um, uh, storage side is got, recently got permission to be extended to 150 megawatts. So all this battery storage need and uh, visa. Uh, good market and attract investment and the looks at in the UK uh, going well. And, but all this is really serves the daily second and uh, the instant balance of the grid. But when we look at the 2050 to achieve net zero, we really is trying to get rid of this uh, brownish color in our generation to get rid of all the fossil fuel and to use all clean energy. But when you look at the wind, this blue line, in early August last month, and uh, in this a few days, it, we don't have much wind. And so, so in that case, energy storage for current, for short term storage and this balance service, probably not enough to change this grey area in our generation into green or into other colors. And so for deep decarbonizations, we need uh, and, uh, more uh, strategies or other type of energy storage. And that's another uh, simple diagram. And at the moment, that's our greenish energy generation. That's the demand in between is to use other type of uh, energy to, to balance. In the future, if you have a lot of uh, uh, non-dispatchable source, from renewable from clean energy and then we have a problem because that's our demand and uh, sometimes we need a very big gap in between this uh, demand and also generation we either just simply install more and more and not just meet the peak demand but uh, much more than peak demand of uh, the power generation the, the plants but that's very costly and and they give you very low power factor and they use very uh, low percentage not economic and so that means in addition to this uh, short-term fast response grid balance energy storage we need long-term and long duration storage this study indicated we, when we increase the percentage of renewable energy and the energy storage we need will be increased as well. And also the increase is not just uh, short term, but also daily, weekly and seasonal and the hours, uh, how, how long you need to store and then to achieve 
this significant decarbonizations. Um, so this this is uh, true, and uh, if you look at recent uh, national grids and future energy scenarios uh, uh, predictions, and uh, no matter in which way we achieve net zero in 2050, either custom transformation, that means we have a lot of uh, uh, change to electrical car, and the change to uh, uh, electrical heating and whatsoever. And uh, all system transformation introduce a lot of hydrogens or fastest way to re phase out of a fossil fuel. And uh, this purple color all over there, that means that storage need. So to achieve net zero in 2050, and definitely energy storage is inevitable, even with uh, this high terawatts hours and hydrogen energy storage or energy available we still need those big and uh, energy storage so look at uh, energy storage technology there is a uh, various options and uh, then this uh, is uh, the the figure about this uh, gave the time and the uh, capacity comparing which one more suitable to which area of uh, which purpose of usage. When we look at uh, large and long durations energy storage, there is various technologies and compressed air, liquid air, and uh, pumped hydro and other thermal storage, hydrogen, and that's quite a lot of technologies. And uh, also they, or any technology comes with a cost. So that's the comparison, this uh, capacity and various technology and the cost and uh, for, for various technologies. And with this comparisons, and uh, so we, with, with this kind of cost and the capacity definitely needed more study to see which ones gave, gave uh, better solutions. And there is a recent uh, uh, paper we published, they did some initial studies and uh, then I certainly use this opportunity. I would uh, quite uh, try to say a few more about a few words more about the compressed air energy storage. And for compressed air energy storage, and it's use the electricity to convert to uh, use compressor and uh, increase air pressure stored and then and the generations uh, that we need. So this uh, compressed energy story has a two kind of uh, weakness when it's a uh, low energy density but when we look at the uk in the uk we have a, in the uk they have um, a lot of a salt cavern salt uh, deposit Ji Hong, I, I think you're muted. Uh, so, Ji Hong, if I'm not sure if you can hear us, but uh, you, you're muted. So, if you could just unmute yourself unless there's noise. Oh, okay. Okay. So now, now we can hear you. Okay. I, I think I I moved my headphones. That's that's a problem. Oh, all right. Okay. No worries. No okay. Worries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just quickly come back. So that's um UK. We did a study with a British ge geological survey. That's UK potential. We have a rich salt deposit to be able to engineer into salt ca uh, cavern to store compressor energy energy. Even they just simply use one percent of this, they would have such kind of a big terawatts hours and storage capacity. That's already existing, Kevin. That's a potential in the UK. So, and then they, based on this, we did another study and just say if we use existing carbon to store compressed air, suppose we have a compressed air and energy storage in place to replace the current gas power plant. And uh, that's how much energy we can provide and to replace the this um, a gas power plant. And that's also in the paper. And for the salt cavern potential also, there's a 
new paper published recently. So to end this um, presentation, and it's no doubt we need energy storage, massive energy storage, and with various scale and durations for to achieve net zero 2050. For fast response energy storage and the market is viable in the UK, and a lot of people want to invest into it. I have three past PhD students to work in this area, two are building a storage plant and one operation, maintaining operation plant. And so as there is a good market, but we need a large scale and long term and to achieve this goal for energy storage. But the market proposition is not clear. And the recent long duration call from base and one company's interest, they work together initially trying to put a proposal in, but after all the financial calculation, they feel takes probably too many years to get the investment back and end up didn't submit the project. So I think this uh, really for long duration uh, storage, if we UK still need to think about it to how can we make a little bit of change to to favor various technology to put in place for a 2050 net zero goal. OK, I stop here. Okay, thanks, um, Ji Hong. Uh, I think we can move now to the uh, yeah. panel uh, session, uh, mm -hmm. where we will be also joined by uh, Dr. Bar De Leu, head of Smart Energy Innovation uh, and Innovation for Climate and Energy at Bayes, and also uh, Dr. Yong, Li Yong Liang uh, Li from the University of uh, Birmingham who's going to be uh, replacing uh, Professor Zibin Wu, who's unable to uh, join, unfortunately, the panel session. But uh, Yong Liang is uh, a reader in the School of Chemical Engineering, and his research uh, interests focus primarily on thermal energy processes and systems, so quite close to what we heard from uh, Professor Zibin. So, Bart, I wonder if you want to give us a couple of uh, high-level comments uh, from Bayes' perspective on uh, these challenges. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me, and, and thank you to all the speakers for excellent talks. And I think they all really present very clearly the, the, the challenges ahead, but also, I suppose, in a way, the opportunities. Um, storage and, and flexibility, which are the areas that my team cover, uh, in a sense, are, are complex compared to many of the other, other areas within our, our innovation portfolio, because there's so many different moving parts and, and possible avenues. Um, to say a bit about the importance of storage, I think it's clear from these presentations and, and to base, uh, it, it's clearly a very important area as well. We see it as uh, having a major uh, potential in, in not only decarbonizing our system, but doing it so at, at a cost, at a minimal cost to get to net zero, uh, particularly through, you know, taking advantage of, of intermittency and, and uh, not, you know, re reducing curtailment in, in the offshore wind um, area. It's come up as a as a key statement, support statement in, in terms of the Prime Minister's 10 point plan, as well as the recently published smart um, system to flexibility plan as well. <laughs> and these also draw and try and draw out where some of the challenges might lie ahead. Uh, there's been significant progress over the over the last few years, but it is clear there are still challenges ahead. And I'll talk a little bit later down the line about the consultation that's currently out. But it's also worth remembering that storage is, is more than often lar large scale storage. Uh, I think Andrew touched on the V2G opportunities there as well, which uh, we are also very keenly exploring uh, and looking how we can overcome those challenges. Um, my team in particular uh, looks at energy storage of flexibility. The most recent <coughs> relevant activity is the uh, 68 million pounds long duration engine storage program, which in itself demonstrates that this is an area that's very important to us. Uh, I can't say too much about that in particular as it's a live competition, but hopefully most of you would have been aware of that before we uh, we got to the close of that. And that looks at the breadth of storage possibilities around electricity storage, thermal storage, as well as power to X. What's clear is um, Technology isn't the only challenge here, and I think all the presentations touch on the financing and the markets and everything else, and particularly when you get to the scale of the projects that we look at supporting, those financial aspects then make it more challenging when, when you, you know, get to close to pre-commercial um, projects. The 
base recognize this and my policy colleagues obviously are aware of this as well which is why they currently do have a consultation out looking at these challenges and i do hope most of you are aware of that and if not please do look on the .gov websites uh, at this consultation which closed the 28th of september which looks at how you know questions on understanding a lot of the challenges that the panelists of uh, not the panelists the present presenters have discussed around the market and, and how is flexibility and storage valued in the market um, how they might be addressed and the risks associated to the various options. So uh, if you haven't done so already and have views, please do uh, participate in that consultation because that is a direct way to, to inform government on a, a broader set of views and, and then potentially influence the policy going forward, which is important for all these, particularly storage technologies and our own program as well in terms of the innovation program that rely on it. So uh, yeah, in short, all very important. The challenge is clear, but also the opportunity but there are a number of levers that government need and uh, need to work with with industry to to make make them sustainable in the long run. I think. Okay, th thanks, Bart, and thanks for the uh, excellent uh, summary of these points. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers once again and move to the uh, uh, to the uh, questions in the order they appeared, and I'll try to bundle a few because. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time. Uh, starting from uh, how they appeared, uh, there's a comment on uh, Orkney and um, also uh, about fuel poverty. So I wonder if um, perhaps um, Ji Hong or um, Yong Liang can, uh, can uh, pick this one up and um, make a few comments about um, fuel poverty, because I, I think this is a quite an interesting uh, aspect and storage could could help a lot with that. Okay, and the, it's it's not uh, my area. I I I think, so. but the, the the things I we recently working with um, a Coventry local council on the Innovate UK project for future energy potentials, and uh, I think the 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 aim is trying to reduce the cost by twenty percent and also clean. But it's really, really challenge and really, really challenge. And uh, I think all the solutions we put there, we, we, we analyze the system scenario from consumers point of view and also from you know, investors point of view and also from DNO operators point of view to see from each angle what's the best solutions as an end. And I think if to avoid in the future is energy is clean, but uh, people cannot afford, if some people. And uh, I think it definitely need some market structure change and to mm. move around the money and then to give some kind of a profit for, for those operators, especially to encourage clean energy investors and also to benefit the consumers. That, that's what I think from this particular Thanks. project. It is not my area anyway. Uh, absolutely, but thanks, thanks. For that. That's that's a very useful uh, comment, and I suppose this brings up the the the, the idea of the, you know when when you put these costs into place and the uh, comments about markets, uh, whether uh, geography can play a role uh, into this thinking, and with fuel poverty also uh, in the mix there. I don't know, Bart, to what extent you think we can we can have targeted uh, either technologies or locations where. Uh, there's uh, different incentives, perhaps, or different market conditions to encourage storage to target these kind of um, challenges. Yeah, I suppose on a general level, fuel poverty is at the core of, of a lot of the government policy, whether it's storage or, or looking at other mechanisms. So certainly, I think considerations that will be looked at by policy colleagues. And certainly, again, um, I would use those consultation mechanisms to try and forward those ideas onto them as well. Um, there are multiple ways at which, you know, government will try to deal with fuel poverty, but clearly ensuring that we don't end up supporting things that will create those kind of issues in futures is in the back of everyone's mind. Thanks. And we've got a couple of questions on compressed air uh, where uh, could be promising, but also um, what are the limitations there and whether uh, the, uh, there's a question for Jihong specifically, 
uh, it looks like value for money, but uh, whether that's the best solution, uh, what's the, what is the best solution associated with uh, the heat storage problem to reheat the expanding air, uh, thermal storage or hydrogen or something else. So it's mainly about the opportunity, but also some of the limitations and the potential solutions there. Okay. And, uh, and I'm doing two things because I um, invigilate my RACIT exam on another screen. Uh, if any student question, I will answer that. But I noticed uh, Dr. Wei He is also in the audience. If, uh, if I, I have to go to my uh, exam session, <laughs> Wei can answer the questions. I think about the case, we did a lot of work about the case technology. It's a case, to be honest, and compared with uh, 10 years ago, had made a great progress in terms of the system efficiency improvement. Um, 10 years ago, when we started working uh, on case analysis, the energy efficiency probably around 40, no more than 50%, and also use a, a fossil fuel. But now the, the best uh, system already in operation and is uh, over 60% round trip efficiency, and the result using any a fossil fuel. And so in terms of technology, it's a keep improving. And certainly when people are talking about 60% and compare with the battery with uh, some others, still feel it's it's low. Uh, but uh, if uh, you think about the sustainability and the compressed air, you everything and it, it, you just use air as a media to store and now if the comp there are quite a lot of work and uh, there's possibility to improve the system efficiency further and into 70 percent there's a, a lot of work and very promising and uh, some demonstration project already in place in in in, in, in the process of constructions. And uh, certainly in terms of research, we're also trying to find a way how it can improve the efficiency. In terms of energy density, yes, you difficult to improve. It just need a largest uh, you know, volume of storage. And, but in the UK, we can a little bit relaxed on this aspect. I believe UK is fortunate. We have the uh, geologic, geological conditions. We can making cost effective storage volume and um, the carbon last 50 years at least if you manu uh, engineer in the van and also we have a lot of gas stored in such kind of carbon and when when the gas gradually fades out and certainly you can put the hydrogen or others but the compressor is another option and for those currents so that, that's my opinion on, on this gas and I, I, I think this mainly I, the case is a is a kind of very clean technology, sustainable and a large scale, and uh, you can store a few days and uh, not any problem, very low leakage. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, there is a question um, endorsed as well about uh, the extent uh, of uh, to what extent different scenarios okay. uh, for electrification of uh, heat uh, and transport uh, affect energy storage options or uh, end opportunities? So I wonder um, if any of the panelists have any comments, especially uh, the ones presenting uh, scenarios, future scenarios. So how uh, these affect the options and opportunities to what extent uh, I suppose it affects decision making or are thinking about design of technology, selection of technologies, economies of scale. I suppose the question is, do we trust these scenarios to what extent? I wonder if someone would like to comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to take to that one, Hannes. Uh, I, again, I think in terms of electrification of transport, I think that is doing two things. Uh, I think clearly the, the electrification of transport, and particularly cars, is driving battery development and technology and reducing cost and clearly they're focused on technologies that hopefully will be safe reliable uh, but also again meet particular metrics in terms of power and energy requirements for for a drive cycle now they might not therefore be the best technologies for grid use particularly if there's it's not being cycled as much uh, as it may in a car or even partially so 
Yeah, but again, I think the main point about that is purely just the sense of scale just now. Yeah, I think, as I said, the, the EV battery market is about 10 times the grid scale. And clearly, if that's driving down lower cost sales, even if they might not be optimal for grid, I still think that's probably the way some of the grid storage will go in, in terms of using, if I can call it, transport type cells. In terms of electrification of heat, I'm going to digress slightly and, and, and actually make uh, or explore not the direct electrification of heat in terms of electric heating elements as well, but, but more had the use of hydrogen gas and, and heaters by that. And actually that development of replacing gas boilers with hydrogen boilers may ultimately give a, a, a competitive edge to fuel cell technology because that might provide the, the rationale for large scale hydrogen production, which might ultimately favor a, again, fuel cell vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Now, the slight caveat in that is that most hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are actually fuel cell battery hybrids. They generally tend to have a battery fraction on the car as well for enabling well, start up initially and regenerative braking. So, so again, uh, exactly how they might pan out, pass. I, I wish I knew, it and then I could could invest in one way or another. But, uh, but come, as I say, I think it just still comes down to a bit of a technology race between battery technologies per se and the battery versus fuel cell. Clearly, battery in the UK is is by far and away the the, the, the leading technology just now, but whether with the potential for replacing <coughs> natural gas with hydrogen for heating, that might start to swing the, the, the scale back towards hydrogen fuel cells, potentially for transport as well. Yeah. And Andrew, just, just to very briefly follow on from this, and to what extent is social acceptance of either these technologies or vehicles agreed being considered so far? And do you think this will be uh, decision maker or for? Good question. I mean, I, I think there have been some interesting studies done on on various safety elements, uh, both from hydrogen safety point of view and from uh, well, obviously the issues, reported issues of, of batteries going in fire, etc. Ultimately, I think the the general public will will go with technology that is promoted Dare I say promoted the best, which is, is a, a very fudgy term because we, we go back to when petrol was the, the dominant fuel and then the government promoted diesel. Uh, clearly, there was, there was a clear swing to using diesel, uh, and there was advantages in that, until they then maybe perhaps realised that the, the technology from some manufacturers wasn't quite what was said on the tin, and clearly there was then other environmental issues from that. So, again, I think. I think the social acceptance on that can be driven the same way that the diesel or change from petrol to diesel was driven by both industry and government. Uh, so uh, again, I think from my my perspective, the, the jury's still out on which way that may go. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, that's very comprehensive. And there's uh, one more question. Can, can, yeah, can I share my Yes, yeah, absolutely. Apologies. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no problem. No problem. Yeah, thanks, uh, all, all the speakers and the panel members. Yeah, I fully agree with them that, uh, uh, yeah, the, the one of the big challenge for you know, the, you know, for the zero future is that the uh, as Jibin and Jihong presented, this is that uh, this is you know long duration or seasonal you know energy demand uh, various, which may cause you know high demand in winter and uh, probably low demand in summer, and uh, clearly. Uh, for most of the any storage technology for batteries or even you know, for compressed air for pump hydro, it's impossible you know to store energy for that long duration. So uh, one thing, in my opinion, that the uh, you know that's power to X or you know the fuel like uh, like hydrogen or methanol or ammonia will be play a very important role in the in the future zero carbon scenario because it is a uh, quite similar the property itself is quite similar to you know conventional fuel. Uh, so I, I yeah I believe that the, this is gonna play an important role. But uh, on the other hand, the round trip efficiency of this chemical fuel it's easy to store for very long duration, but the round trip trip efficiency is quite bad. So it's very likely that uh, probably in future, 
you know, the the uh, the combination of this, uh, yeah, this this energy vector with other, you know, energy storage technology will play an important role. So take the compressed air and storage uh, as an example. You know, the original concept of a compressed air is to decouple the gas turbine system, which still use the, you know, fossil fuel, even nature gas. But then we move to a clean future. So nowadays, most of the compressed air and storage uh, focus on the pure compressed air. That, 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 that is that, uh, you know, no nature gas. But probably in the future, let's say, uh, the technology can go back, combine this, uh, you know, conventional compressed air with the, this is this clean vector with let's say hydrogen or, or ammonia in this combustion process, so that that uh, you know this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this chemical storage or chemical fuel are gonna play a role of long duration stored energy from summer to winter, while let's say compressed air can meet the uh, you know variation or meet the, the gap between let's say day or night or you know week and weekend. Uh, yeah. That yeah, that that might be uh, something in the yeah, in the future if uh, you know we fully you know ban it all the uh, conventional uh, fossil fuel. Uh, and and I also have uh, some yeah something to share about the uh, 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 energy poverty is that uh, it's very likely in my opinion that the probably you know because currently most of energy comes from the fossil fuel, so the the centralized generation, the centralized power supply play a very important role. And in future, if uh, the renewable play a leading role, then the decentralized, decentralized or distributed system, uh, you know, gonna play a leading role. In this case, uh, yeah, we're gonna have some, let's say you mentioned the region, probably that we're gonna have some energy rich region or energy poor region. And in this case, the storage probably gonna play a very important role to, yeah, to balance this, uh, this, uh, energy, you know, resource imbalance or, you know, probably thing that, yeah, that might be something that, yeah, we can think about as well. Thanks. Thanks, Yongliang. We've got one more question uh, that um, I think will be uh, forced to put uh, through email. So I'll um, forward it to Angela just to mention it here. Uh, there's a question about integrated storage with power converters and how do we see the um, penetration of these, especially given the lack of uh, definition of the grid code. I will uh, park this question for now and um, ask the panel members to respond through uh, through email, uh, but I've noted down the uh, the question and the name of the person, so we'll, uh, we'll pick that up. I'd like to uh, hand over to uh, Yu Long, uh, but first of all, thank the uh, panel members and the presenters for the wonderful for presentations and uh, discussions and thanks everyone for the attention and uh, excellent uh, questions i think that was a really good uh, discussion so thank you everyone and uh, over to to you yulong thank you harris and uh, uh, thank you everyone uh, particularly our panel members and also our speakers and lay, which lay out all the uh, numbers which is uh, i found uh, although I can't remember all those numbers, but the, the, it's clear, it's clear, UK for, if you force to 100% renewables, uh, we would need something like about 300 gigawatts uh, storage. And think about 300 gigawatts storage. Globally today, it's about 200, maybe a bit more than 200 gigawatts installation globally. So, um, which is insufficient for the UK only. So. So if you multiply that sort of, uh, um, uh, 200 300 sort of gigawatts uh, by hundreds, and uh, so the opportunity is huge. So, so um, clearly there is a need for short term storage batteries and uh, uh, electric chemical storage and the flywheel, probably the, the uh, super caps uh, for power grid uh, um, quality, but there is uh, a lot more needs for the uh, uh, medium term and long term the heat, heat and cold storage and also the, the uh, um, flu batteries, for example, and so on and so forth, uh, compressed air, liquid air, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so clearly, the, um, we know that the, the order of magnitude leads uh, uh, both in the UK and globally, and, uh, but we actually don't know which technologies or which combination of technology will, will address that in the best way in terms of economics, affordability, and uh, sort of uh, environmental impact. 
those environmental impacts. So lots of work to be done, and there are lots of sort of a role, a bigger role for the sport to play in the future. So I'll conclude that and uh, the, the meeting, and uh, I thank all for um, contribution, your contribution, and also a specific thanks to the Bioenergy Hub people for uh, uh, coordinating, and, and uh, also thanks to Angela and uh, Harris to help with all those. Uh, thank you all very much. And I think the, the session is closed. And uh, there will be a session tomorrow, uh, which is uh, uh, about the cross uh, hub collaborations and uh, uh, welcome you all to attend as well in simple time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Yolong. Cheers. Bye.